this FDC Academy live stream. As always, my co-host Peter Chalmers is with me. Peter, good day. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. I've got to do it. You know, yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> well, this is we're 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 lucky. It's across our guest today, Peter. It's not even the same day of the week. So, oh, yeah, it's yesterday. It's yesterday exactly. <laughs> So uh, we're very uh, excited this week to welcome along Stephen Chandler Garcia, uh, who is a developer evangelist at Salesforce. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, and good morning to both of you. It's approaching early evening here, so. And uh, tra today. yeah, traditionally we uh, we we do a check in with the weather. It's it's a sunny winter's day here in New Zealand. Peter, you've got something similar in it is. your part it's of the a, world. It's it's the same. It's, it's about sixteen degrees Celsius here, so sun. But it's beautiful. We're just chatting off air, Stephen. What's uh, what's the temperature in your neck of the woods today? Yeah, so we've we've just hit our peak of the day at forty four Celsius. So 44 Celsius. right in the middle of summer, one hundred and eleven for anyone in the US at the moment. It's nice and hot and dry in the Nevada desert. I'm a little bit jealous. Forty four is a little bit. <laughs> You know too much but you know yeah, yeah it was should, should i do the show should i go to the pool i think maybe i can go to the pool afterwards we'll see it's a little bit overcast cool so we will get the paperwork out of the way first i guess and uh, viewers can currently see the forward-looking statement on their screens uh, as we always display when we have a guest from Salesforce with us. Uh, so the long and the short of it is please do not make any buying decisions based on uh, what we discussed today and only on what is available uh, already. So our theme for today uh, is going to be security and, and privacy, uh, which is an, an area, Stefan, that, that you're very passionate about. But do you want to start off by just giving us a bit of a background of, of what you do as a developer evangelist? Yeah, of course. So um, being a developer evangelist at Salesforce is a really cool job. Um, we do a lot of things like maintain the Trollhead sample gallery, um, which is a collection of apps that we build and maintain uh, hosted on the Trailhead site that you can download into your orgs um, and really check out some of the cool functionality of Salesforce from a developer perspective. Um, that has then gone a bit further towards some of the admin roles as well with the release of the automation components recipes. So if you're interested in Flow Process Builder, we've created a load of code-based samples that you can use to include and extend those declarative tools as well. Um, some of the other things we do, we contribute and really help out the developer community uh, in many different Slack channels on social media whenever anyone has questions. Um, we contribute to the conferences, to the user groups when they're happening. Um, an example of something we've been doing virtually is speaking at a lot of the global gatherings. So you might have seen me recently, I actually spoke at the Wellington New Zealand user group a few weeks back and the Sydney, the joint user group who's running their global gathering. Um, and so we get to really contribute and give back to the community, which is probably one of my favorite parts of the job. Very cool. So if we start off with, with the theme, why, why is privacy such a hot topic at the moment? Well, I think uh, everyone was sort of sent into a shock um, around Europe a few years back with this regulation that was being talked about and introduced called the General Data Protection Regulation um, that really changed the way of, around sort of telling companies how they should be handling someone's information. And I think it's really important to emphasize that when, when we're talking about someone's personal data, we're talking about any personal information about them. Um, and whether that be a business email, a business phone number, or their personal contact information. Um, this regulation really widened a lot of the definitions around what businesses can do with data. And it really states that if you're processing someone's data, you then have a strict set of rules that you have to abide by. Now, it then defines processing as this really long list of terms um, they're not going to go into, but the key one is the word use. And so it pretty much says if you're using someone's data, in some way or form or putting it into a system, then you have to abide by their sort of the rules of the GDPR, which really state that you have to give that person rights. You should only be processing that data for a specific purpose. And once that purpose has then been fulfilled, you shouldn't be keeping that data any longer unless it's legally necessary. Um, and that really, I guess, agitated a lot of people 
because it almost infringes on the way that a lot of marketing organizations run currently um, and really puts a new lens onto that. Now, that's why I've sort of started working around that in this, the Salesforce world, but taking it a step further, just in January, we had the California Consumer Privacy Act um, enacted in California, which is really the first privacy related law like that in the US that brings in similar regulations to the GDPR around how you're processing someone's data and whether or not you vet can validate that permission that they've given you to process. I think that it, it really changes the way that we look at a lot of the stuff that we do when talking about Salesforce, because at the end of the day, it's a CRM system and it's all about that customer and that personal data. If you think about some of those key objects within your orgs, you're generally focusing on your contacts, your users, your leads, maybe your personal accounts. And so we've got all this sort of personal people related data in our work. So we need to be mindful of the way that regulations tell us to use that data. Yeah, well, it's called the customer 360, isn't it? So yes. <laughs> that's sort of at the, at the heart of it. Oh yeah. So given that, I mean, that can be rather complex at the end of the day, when you, when you think about what data would be holding inside Salesforce and in the various permutations of that. How do you structure things? How do you how do you manage that that privacy? And you know what's what's the the best way to do that? Yeah, so I actually like to think there are sort of four key areas, um, and I will go through this in a lot of my presentations. But around the ways that you can approach sort of unified privacy management in a platform like Salesforce, um, and the initial step of that is to really discover and understand what personal data you have about people within your org and where you're storing that data. If you think, like I said earlier, we've got, we have contacts, we have leads, we have personal accounts, we have users, we now have employees, five sort of standard objects that we're storing personal data against. And we need to understand at what part in our customer life cycle, we're storing someone in those chains. So someone may come in as a lead, they may come in as three leads, depending on how good your deduplication is. You've then converted them. We have a contact and an account for them. And then maybe they've signed up as a customer. So you've enabled them in your customer portal you can have a user record for them. Um, and you're looking at sort of three representations of that same person within your org with different opt-out checkboxes on each record, different preferences on each record. And so it's important that you go through initially and understand what that life cycle is and where the data sits within your org. Not until then can you actually start exercising some of those rights that people get within regulations like the GDPR, like a, a big one that everyone talks about is this right to be forgotten, where if someone asks to be deleted from your database, you must delete them. Well, technically you, you only have to delete them if you don't have a valid reason for storing that data or a specific purpose that sits within a proper lawful basis. So for example, in the UK um, where I was living while working on a lot of this, this data protection stuff, um, if someone leaves your company, you legally are meant to store their data for seven years. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I've quit and I've, I've left the business, and then I send you an email a month or two or, or even five years later and say, hey, I'd like to exercise my right to be forgotten. Delete me from all of the HR systems, delete all my employee records, everything. You can then come back to me and say, no, I still have a lawful basis to process your data based on a contractual agreement or employment agreement with you. And so you don't have that right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you validate that without knowing where their information is, without knowing why you have their data, why you're processing it? because then it's not just employees, it's customers who may be under contract, who may have warranties, it's customers who have a, a proper reason to, per, to process that data. And if you can't justify that, if you don't know where that data sits, you're sort of in a mess when trying to process against any of those rights that may be exercised. Now, the third aspect of that is, okay, we've got data in Salesforce, maybe we have multiple Salesforce orgs, maybe we have data in spreadsheets, Maybe we have data in a finance system. Maybe we're using something like Xero to process and collect invoices. How do we start to communicate? And that's where it gets a little bit more technical and developer focused, where you might need to lean on some of your developers um, to look at how you can orchestrate things with events. Um, Salesforce have really enabled their platform to help you do this um, by enabling all of those things like opt-out fields, updates to contacts, and some of the other records we might talk about in a little bit to emit events so that you can then capture those changes to data in other systems. Um, but that's where it does get into the point of needing to start to really orchestrate those tasks. Um, and then lastly, you have to write everything down. Um, the, my, one of my favorite parts and one of the most annoying parts of the GDPR is that it requires you to justify consent for having someone's data. 
So if someone's ticked that box that says, I consent to receiving email information marketing, you have to track what they agreed to, what text they agreed to when they checked that box, the date they checked it, where they checked it, so which page on the website, and you have to store what the purpose is for storing that data. And it seems like, oh my gosh, this is out of nowhere, where am I gonna do this? Well, Salesforce created 19 standard objects, which seems like a lot. <laughs> uh, we can get into the details of some of them, but to help you store that information. And so those objects are out of the box in Salesforce for you to store that consent data um, from someone. And it really takes all of those four things. And so, so discovering, finding where your information is, then giving them the power to make some of these changes and, and some of these requests, talking to all of your systems by orchestrating them, and then actually documenting why you have that information. And it's, it's, it's a lot, it is a big project. Um, but if you follow it sort of in that precise way and take it little by little, it at least shows that you're sort of getting there and taking the right steps in order to comply. Uh, obviously, depending on the size of your business, there are many people that are going to want to input on these decisions um, and lots of people who have data that you need to, to find and, and get access to. So 19 additional standard objects. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It is a, so, that is a bit. <laughs> Well, so the way that it works is it's almost like a choose your own adventure book, the way that the objects have been created. So like I said, once again, we have all of our people objects, user, person account, lead, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I like to, to think of those not as people, but as sort of personas and representations of people. Mm -hmm. um, because you may have that same person represented in multiple places within your org. Um, about three years ago now, Salesforce introduced an object called the individual object. Mm -hmm. And the individual object um, is used to represent that person's identity. So that singular person within Salesforce, almost like if you're using an identity management solution, maybe something like Okta, you have your login that then logs you into all of your other systems. In the case of Salesforce, you have your individual that represents all of the people within Salesforce. Now, Downstream from the individual are a series of consent objects. And so an individual can consent against something, but a contact a leader or user themselves cannot. That way, when that individual has consented, that relationship exists all the way up through their contact, their lead, their user. And so you don't have multiple versions of the truth. You can run off that same individual in that instance. Now, there are then five different types of consent that you can record against a person. Um, that it may seem like overkill, but thinking about what they do, it makes, it makes a bit of sense. Um, and the first of those um, is the first one that was released into Salesforce, and that's called the contact point type consent. And the key word in there is type. It's about consenting to a specific channel so that if your business, all you're worried about is whether or not you can email someone, a person can consent against a specific channel. So you can consent against email communications and then you can look up to a purpose record. And a purpose is that specific purpose for which you're processing data. So maybe you're a marketing company that uses LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Your LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a purpose for processing. If you're a data that uses Facebook custom audiences for targeting, your Facebook custom audience is your, is your, your um, purpose. Or if you're just doing email marketing, email marketing is your purpose. And it's about just generally consenting for a channel and a purpose. So. I've consented for you to market to me via email, or I've consented to you to market to me via SMS. And that was really the first one that was released. That then started expanding as customers were asking for more ways of consenting. And the next one of those was consenting against an authorization form. So a lot of times when you're, you're filling out a form on someone's website, you'll then be asked to agree to the privacy policy. You might be asked to agree to the terms and conditions. Um, both of those will give you the ability to consent against those records. And so you can then consent against completing a privacy policy, consent against completing those terms and conditions. And it just grows out from there. You can then consent to a subscription. So you can now break it in down to subscriptions. You can consent to using someone's specific contact point, like an email address, an address or a phone number. And then the last one is you can consent to an action, like data sharing, like data collection and data processing at more of a high level around that. And it, it can get quite complex, but I always think to start small, start with something like that contact point type consent um, before you start building up like a really regimented consent program in that sense. But you can really choose the way in which you approach it. And so 
It's building on a, a basic use case. Um, how do you start populating all those objects? So, you know, customer might be using web to lead as a very basic contact form. Does that have the ability to to start capturing automatically some of these consents kind of flowing through and records being created uh, and mapped kind of through? Uh, or is there a, still a, a little bit of orchestration required to, to maybe have something on the lead that then triggers a flow that goes and creates these records and that kind of thing? Yeah, so generally you still require a little bit of process automation there. I like to think of using the source field on the lead as a mapping to a lot of these processes um, because when you're collecting the data, you know where it's coming from. You know that it's coming from a web to lead form. It's probably from a specific page and you could map that form directly there. And so that way, when that lead comes in, you can then either maybe write a process that inserts the record. You can write a flow that maybe go out, goes out and does a little bit more complex calculation and queries the record. Or you could write a trigger that goes and queries every record in Salesforce to figure out what it needs to create. Um, so it really depends on your appetite and how much automation you need behind it. But if you can find a, a direct one-to-one -one mapping between your lead source and that consent or that permission, um, it's usually the cleanest way of doing that. Yeah. And just dawns on me, there's, uh, and again, probably some processing required, but a lot, a lot of what you've talked about in terms of channels and subscriptions and that kind of thing would have a flow and effect to something like Marketing Cloud or, or whatever your marketing tool is really. Is, is that again starting to, to move the source of truth for some of these consents and subscriptions that may have previously lived in a marketing tool? How, how should people think about where they're storing these consents? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Obviously, it depends on the size of your organization, um, where you're going to be processing and storing this data. But at one point in time, that consent or those opt-ins and subscriptions were only relevant to marketing. But now, more and more, they're relevant to the entire business. Every time you load up a lead, a contact record, you should be able to validate whether or not you can contact them. And so if we can then start to really track back sort of at that source of the data, which in most cases of when in the customers we're talking to is Salesforce, um, it needs to start there. Now, when it comes to syncing, um, you can use things like data extensions in Marketing Cloud and custom objects and, or standard objects in Pardot to sync those through. But it really depends on the level that you need those to come through in, into those platforms. Yeah. So in the scenario that, you know, I've, I've said, look, well, forget me. I'm, don't want anything to do with you anymore but you know for some reason next week i'll come back and go well actually we'll log in or well, not log in you know go and raise another uh, inquiry that's a whole new process isn't it i mean mm -hmm. it's not going to go well there's nothing there in the first place it it, it can't find anything that i've done before so i'm, I'm going to be treated as a, a completely different um um individual yeah on that um so it's, it's really down to how the business approaches the regulations. There are, is obviously lots of wiggle room for interpretation, mm. um, but there, it's all around sort of like back when we were first starting to explore this stuff, um, I had gotten a load of working groups together before I worked for Salesforce to try and figure out how do you best approach this mm. um, from a CRM perspective. And a lot of it is around, um, it's, it's difficult if you're in a B2C business, but if you're in a B2B business, start centering your opportunities, your tasks, mm start centering everything around the account and let that person be interchangeable. Because whether or not, I, I mean, you may not be able to delete me from your system, but I may quit my company next mm -hmm. week. I'm no longer valid contacts for you. So who are you then gonna go in place of that? Well, are you gonna just go back to my contact record and look at those tasks on a constant basis every time you need to find out some more information? So start centralizing your reporting against the account. Start centralizing all of your tasks, your activities against the account and then you become less dependent on the specific person representing that information. Obviously, it really sort of reams home the whole, it, 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 yeah, and it reams home the whole, you know, keep your data clean, keep it structured so that you, um, um, well, you've got clean data and you don't have a mess if you ever try to unwind your stuff, so. Yeah, um, so there's, there's a service um, called Flat Icon. I don't know if any of you use Flat Icon to get little images and icons for your presentations. It's a good service. Well, I got an email from them today um, to say that my data was part of a data breach. Okay. Um, so my information was hacked as part of their systems being insecure. Okay. 
Um, I've not been a customer of Flat Icons. I, I don't think I've logged in for over 12 months. Um, I did have a subscription to them. I paid them for a while, so I, I'm not sure what's in the terms and conditions, but it was over 12 months ago. I mean, it was actually before I joined Salesforce, so even even further before then, so maybe almost, almost two years now. Um, but they still have my info on file, and they've had it there, and it's been hacked. Now, what gives them the justification for storing my registration, my login information still to this day, even though I dropped my subscription years ago, it seems. Um, data breaches are happening more and more frequently. If our data is in less people's systems, there's a greater chance that we will, won't be affected by these data breaches and attacks. And so in theory, if you're only keeping your data for the time in which is necessary, then mm. there will be less people affected if there is a breach of your systems at some point in time. What other things can you do to ensure that you've got secure data? Are yeah. there other apps and things like that? Yeah, of course. So, so putting a, putting there's pressing pause on data protection, um, focusing on more of the privacy and security mm. aspect of it. If we're talking about Salesforce, I mean, we do a lot um, from an infrastructure level to keep the data secure on platform. Um, we've got our full list of third party certifications that you can view on the trust website. Um, we have our own real time replication of secure data centers that require really strict access to gain access to from a network level. Um, we have really secure firewalls, IP login restrictions. Um, we do a lot of pen testing internally and threat detection. Um, and then we expose a load of functionality to our customers who are using the platform as part of sort of our platform and application services. Um, things like our identity platform so that you have really tight control over how users gain access to that. Um, we, you can enable two-factor authentication um, not just for accessing Salesforce, but for modifying critical features with the mm -hmm. platform. Um, I mean, if you, any admin out there will know how deep you can get into profiles and permissions and roles and how that really secures data access, not only from a record level, but also from a field and object level. Um, even further than that, we've now introduced permission set groups to make it easier to apply specific permission sets, which almost enable you as an admin to be more granular about what data access you're giving. Um, and just from a, a data storage perspective, um, if you're following a lot of those application services um, that are out of the box, um, you can really keep a tight eye on your system. Uh, one thing that a lot of people still don't know about that's very useful is the security health check. So any Salesforce customer can go into setup and if you search security health check, or I think it's just health check now, um, it will show you how you rank amongst 37 specific security vulnerabilities um, based on your current settings. And it can go through and you can select all and you can go and update them to the highest standard setting um, to ensure that you're keeping your org secure. Really is one of the benefits of the platform, isn't it? Yeah. You, know, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff at all because it's all done for us. Mm. Um, and it's at the highest level, so. Yeah, there's a remind me. There's another feature um, that's been out a few releases now. Where if you edit any kind of custom field, you can indicate whether it contains identifiable information, that kind of thing. So you can start to build up your own audit logs of these are the sensitive fields that we've created. That any time you're touching these fields, you know you need to be cautious in what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, and that's part of when we talked. About, I was talking about sort of that documentation earlier almost understanding which fields you have in Salesforce that are going to be storing classified or sensitive information, or whether there's personal data kept in those fields. That's part of that initial sort of documentation and then further on auditing process, ensuring that the data you have is in the right places. Um, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen the same custom field for the same information. That's probably personal information, like three different custom fields for emails, custom fields for name even. Um, you can you can think of it. I've seen it, um, and it just gives you an extra layer of ability to classify um, those fields. And what, that feature is called data classification. Uh, if anyone wants to go out and check out the help docs for that, it's available in everyone's org. I'm sure you've seen it. Probably glossed over it, but it's just an extra step when creating any field that you should really be taking to ensure that everything has been completed and documented uh, as you're going along. Yeah, that's definitely something we've been using for a few months now with with clients since we I think the one thing 
it might have changed, but those classification fields don't show up when you create a new field, just when you go back and edit it kind of after the fact. So it's kind of just knowing that it's there and that you need to loop back yeah. and, and kind of document um, that information as well. Yeah, definitely have to check that out um, to verify. But if that's the case, yeah, super important to make sure you go back and do it. Who's going to ask the question? Who's going to ask the question? <laughs> I was going to say, how, how can you, uh, it's never foolproof, but you know, how can you protect against what might be you know, appropriate uses of data that yeah. that become inappropriate? So um, I know, a disgruntled staff member uh, leaves and runs a report on all of this data and takes a spreadsheet with them. Is there any way to protect against something like that? Yeah, so, so there is out of the box. Um, there are ways that you could technically go in and write some Apex to get some of this information, but we actually have a product called Salesforce Shield um, that you may have heard of. A lot of people have heard of it, but have no idea what it does or what it is. Um, but Shield really consists of three specific tools. Um, and those are, the first two are, well, is our field audit trail which gives you a 10 year audit trail history of all of your field updates and changes, whereas out of the box, you only get uh, 18 months of field history tracking. Um, we then have platform encryption, um, which encrypts data at the server level. So at rest, not, we're not talking about start out fields on your, your records, actually encrypting the data um, and then decrypting it as it gets to the user interface. Um, and then the last one, which would prevent against some of the stuff you're talking about and is my favorite is event monitoring. Um, and if you don't know what event monitoring is, um, it's pretty common in the computer science and technology world where anytime there's an action in the system, there's a log of that action happening. And that action could be clicking on a link, um, updating a page, uh, viewing a specific record. And there's, I mean, even API execution, code running, everything is logged as an event log within Salesforce. And if you sign up to event monitoring, you get access to all of that data. Now to take that a step further, a few releases ago, we launched real-time events, which take a platform event, um, which is almost a, a trigger that's fired when a change happens um, that can then be consumed in other systems. Um, we take that and fire an event um, that then allows you to take action on something happening. Now, in the case that you're talking about, where someone is downloading a report that maybe they shouldn't have access to. Um, I've actually written up an example of this uh, recently in the Salesforce developer blog, but you can then take action on that and verify that someone's downloaded the report uh, and then do something about it. Um, and the way that works is through a tool called transaction security policies. And transaction security policies really consist of three things. You have an event, you then have that condition. So, what did they do? Does this cause, does this look suspicious? Um, and then an action. So you can then block the user from the action or you can just email it in the administrator. So in this case, we have that real time event of a report execution that triggers the condition. The condition then can evaluate that user. Um, in the example I use in the developer blog, I talk about adding users who may be sort of on a watch list in a public group. So you can then go through, there is a little bit of code in this example, but uh, you need to go through, you can then do a lookup for any users on the watch list and see if the user that downloaded the report is on the watch list. And then if so, you can then execute that action. And so you can stop the user from downloading or notify someone. Um, there are uh, conditions that you can write in the condition builder, which is the declarative tool for transaction security policies, but those are generally based on one criteria. So for example, if, um, Peter, you were to download uh, a list of all of the high net worth contacts that you have in your org to go and try and get yourself some business uh, after you leave, um, you, can ex you can set criteria around the sums and the totals within the report and the total number of people on the report as well. So maybe you can download 50 records, but you don't want anyone to download over 100 records. Um, there are loads of really cool things like that you, that you can do within transaction security policies. Now, you may not have Shield within your orgs, um, but there are some great trailhead modules. There was actually one released recently on the enhanced transaction security policies that give you an org that has all of these features enabled, 
but at least if you want to see what they're like, try them out, um, you can go in to that trailhead playground and get really hands-on with some of these tools. That's good. So I, I think if nothing else, um, I think a lot of customers know about Shield, but don't know the practical examples like you've yeah. just shared. Yeah. Um, and and perhaps the account executives might struggle to describe it. Um, yeah. That, yeah, these, you know, I know it comes with a price tag, but when you start getting into these practical examples, it's starting to demonstrate the return on investment. I mean, event monitoring is such a cool product. I, I can't believe that anyone would say no to it um, because of that level of security that it gives you. Now, the person who may be saying no may be being the marketing team, the sales team, who are looking at the price of Salesforce and saying, no, you can't have any more. But the second you tell anyone in IT that Salesforce has this capability, they're chomping at the bit to get access to it because they're used to having event monitoring. I mean, one of the biggest platforms that we'll see for event monitoring is Splunk. And almost every app that IT may have has a Splunk connector that they can use. Well, so does Salesforce. And if you have event monitoring, you can feed all of those event logs into all of your business's event monitoring tools like they're used to. And almost not forget that Salesforce is an IT and technology platform. And that if you start to speak to those teams in those lang these languages, they get really excited and we'll get more on board with Salesforce in the long run. That's pretty cool. Um, are there any other apps out there that, that does something like this? You know, are there anything on the app exchange that, that you'd be suggesting is something to look at? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of paid solutions um, that look at some features like this. Um, one of them is a company called Fair Warning, um, who do a lot of work as an add-on to event monitoring, who will help you write triggers and alerts and analyze the data a bit better than you can do within Salesforce. But it's worth noting that event monitoring does come with um, five Einstein analytics licenses okay. for the event monitoring analytics app. So they're only for the purpose of using that app, but you can take a, all of the event monitoring data, bring it into Einstein analytics and analyze it with some pre-configured dashboards and reports. Um, obviously you can build on that more with your own, but it is worth noting that that does come as part of that event monitoring license, which I think is, is worth the value alone uh, mm -hmm. to be fair. Um, when it comes to free solutions, I think I've mentioned to both of you that I love building apps for the App Exchange through the Salesforce Labs program. Um, if you're not sure what Salesforce Labs is, um, it's a program where Salesforce employees are encouraged to build apps and then distribute them for free on the App Exchange. And prior to joining Salesforce, I've used many through the years. They've saved me lots of time um, when it comes to actually building something from scratch that may already exist and be free. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to do and join was sort of give back and start creating those myself. And so one that might be interesting if you have multiple orgs um, is a, a friend and I have created a multi-org security summary that actually allows you to take the, that health check data I was talking about earlier mm -hmm. and sync it between orgs so that you can get real-time alerts around when security settings change within orgs. And if you're managing multiple sandboxes that have data in them and personal data in them, it's good to have that visibility and ensure that the security is as up to par as your production org. Um, another one that I've released recently is a cookie consent component for communities. So in a lot of countries, you're now required to have consent for dropping cookies. Um, this just allows you to capture that consent within Salesforce against an individual object. Um, that one is uh, quite interesting because every business wants a consent banner to look their way. And so while we can't provide all of that functionality declaratively, um, all of the source code is available on GitHub through mm -hmm. the Salesforce Labs repo. So if you have any developers in your organization that can take a look at that, all that code is available if you wanted to use it and reuse it and reskin it yourself for your business. Um, and then the last one security related that I've released is a, uh, it's actually a flow template on the App Exchange. So anyone who's using flow, um, flow templates allow you to take a flow that's been put on the app exchange and just clone it into your environment. And so you can update it, you can move things around, you can change the screens. Um, and this flow template is there to help you create those consent records. So the first thing it does is if you land on a contact that doesn't have an individual record associated to it or a lead, it will create that for you. And then you can walk through visually how to create that consent. So select the legal basis, select the purpose, and takes this, this record that's really complex um, 
around the data that it needs and then spreads it out into a screen flow that you can use to easily collect that information um, when you're in the Salesforce UI. Nice. Very nice. That's pretty cool. Um, Stephen, what role does um, critical updates play? So I've um, seen yeah. an increase in these over the last couple of years as this kind of security and privacy focus comes on. And some of them, to be honest, might go over an admin's head in terms of what the, the potential impact of not uh, activating a critical update of, you know, and there's been some in the last few months around uh, guest account access and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, well, what's your comment on that? It's, it seems to me that it's pretty key for admins to actually spend some time understanding and implementing these critical updates. Yeah, big time. Well, speaking to the, the, the one that everyone is talking about at the moment, um, guest users and data access. Um, I think over time, um, communities have become a really popular product. They're one of my favorite pieces of Salesforce, actually, um, because you can take that Salesforce runtime all of those platform services and just expose them to the internet, um, which means that you can do some really cool things really easily. But there have been no rules and regulations around what you do there. And so you could just accidentally give access to all of your contacts publicly um, on by checking that box that says this community is available to the public and not checking the profile and permission sets of that guest user. And so Salesforce has made some changes where you are required now to give a guest user access to Apex classes and methods that they may be accessing to query for data, as well as have restricted the level of data that is by given to a community user by default. And if you have not seen the writing on the wall, um, as it's been talked about for about eight, nine months now, and made some changes to the way you're configured, um, you may have hit issues when that release has then been updated or as these critical updates start to then be forced into your orgs. A great example is a lot of people will use flows and screen flows in particular to collect information about someone in a community. And a lot of times that may be a guest user or a form on that community. Um, so what Salesforce have done is changed flows so that you can run them in system context. And so you can run that flow as the system and you're not reliant on that guest user permissions. But what that would have required you is to understand that that was happening um, go and read the release notes, watch the readiness webinars around the fact that this change needs to happen, go in and make that change within your flows. If you ignored everything, then you probably had a, a bit of a nasty surprise when some of this started to come to your org. Yeah, Def definitely something to, to keep being mindful of. And it's very easy when that banner comes up saying there are critical updates for your org, but you've, you've gone to the setup menu for a purpose that wasn't that and sort of quickly hit dismiss and carry on with what you're doing. And, and yeah, I, you know, we're working with a lot of our customers now on let's ensure that we've got that cycle with each release to make sure we deal with any you know updates that come with that release to, to keep on top of some of the stuff. Yeah, I mean, a great example where I've totally ignored it is... Um, I was working on this cookie consent component for Salesforce Labs, um, and it was great, 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 great. Through security review, published to the App Exchange. A week later, I hadn't configured it and made it possible to be compliant with the new guest user permissions. Right. I thought I had, and I thought I had enabled it in the org that I was developing in, but I would, I thought I'd done something wrong, and so I then started to get a stream of emails around. This, I can't assign this permission set to the user. I can't assign this permission set. Even yesterday, I'm still getting them um, because it just keeps changing the shape of everyone's community is different. And so even as a developer, it really changes the way that you have to think about developing around the critical updates and never let your code go stale or your mm. process builders, your flows, never let them go stale. Always be mindful of what is coming and what will be impacted and really keep a, a good eye on what exists within your environment. The need to keep your your org healthy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, the one it's a common about. theme. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that sort of leads into my next question: was it's more than keeping your org healthy; it's keeping all of your orgs healthy. There's a a lot of people with you know full copy sandboxes, partial copy sandboxes yeah. that's cloning some of the sensitive data, yeah. but suddenly you come across customers that are just a bit more lax with who has this sysadmin access to their mm -hmm. sandboxes and and the like but you really need to treat them exactly like a production instance. 
Well, you can yeah, do more damage a... from a sandbox, can't you? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure we've all seen that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Done it. Been there. Um, so Salesforce released a, a cool a tool, um, once again, a, a paid feature called Data Mask that actually allows you to create rules to obfuscate the data within your sandboxes. So I think it's pretty cool. That's something yeah. that came out towards the end of last year and really helpful if you have large volumes of data that you're pushing into full copy sandbox. Um, there are loads of app exchange vendors that do similar things as well. So please go and check those out. Um, but it's it's really important to, to keep keep an eye on those those sandboxes. I, I I've become a huge fan of the Scratch org development model and using the source to do that. Um, and as that grows and gets more sophisticated, um, I think that it's really changed the way that I look at building things on Salesforce from source, as if I were developing on any technology stack instead of just a specialized process for Salesforce. And as developers, we can do that now. I think as sort of Salesforce starts to grow. There's some recent announcements at Trohead DX around sort of the DevOps Center and those tools. There's a new tool called the Release Management Hub as part of that, that I think are then going to bring some of these source ideas and these scratch or development sort of methodologies into the hands of admins as well. So I'll be really excited to see how that progresses over the next year. Yeah. Yeah. If I had, if I had a wish, it would be that that data masking feature uh, was bundled in rather than a, a paid add-on just to encourage more people to use it um, because there's really no reason that you wouldn't want to mask your, your sandbox data mm -hmm. for sure super important yeah well we're sort of coming up on time now um it's been a sort of a fascinating discussion and i'm sure there's many more rabbit holes we could go down on this front but um Stephen, thank you very much for joining us today and, and talking about security, privacy, the implications of which and you know, some of the things people should be aware of. Um, I certainly wasn't aware that there was 19 new objects on this front. Uh, I think I'd seen two or three of them. Um, obviously, there's probably a few that are the glue behind the scenes that, that hold them all together, but um, that's something that I'm going to take away from this and dig into a lot deeper. Uh, Peter, any takeaways for you? Um, well, I learn about what more about Shield. I mean, I've, mm. I've heard about it, you know, so many times, and also realised that it's not part of the Avengers. Um, that was a really bad joke. <laughs> but no, I mean, and the event monitoring side of things that was actually quite interesting. So yeah, yeah excellent. Well, Stephen, thanks again. Uh, really enjoyed having you on the show, and I think we've we've shared some really valuable information with our audience today. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you, Thank you. Uh, next time.